Hey, good day and good evening, everyone. As always on Tuesday, welcome everybody. I hope you had a great week and it's a pleasure to see you all here again. Please let me know if you can hear me. I hope that everything is working fine. And of course, I will be grateful for the feedback from you. So if you can let me know by typing in that you can hear me, uh, it would be awesome. I'm Sophie and I will be your host today. And of course, welcome to IVF webinars by Egg Donation Friends. As I said, we meet here every week to link you with the best fertility experts. And all our IVF webinars are available on our website, eggdonationfriends.com slash IVF dash webinars. Research it, use it, share it with anybody who may need this knowledge because sharing is caring. IVF webinars are brought to you with help of our partners and our partners are Eisel Spende, Fertility Clinics Abroad and Donor Conception Network. And today we are here to talk about embryo transfer, implantation window and uterine lining and how they depend on each other. And we are here today with Dr. Natalia Schlarp. Hi, Dr. Natalia. Uh, for those of you who are with us week by week, you probably know Dr. Natalia from her previous webinars. But if you are with us for the first time or somehow missed the previous IVF webinars with Dr. Natalia, I will tell you that she's the medical director at IVF Spain. And moreover, she's a brilliant specialist and extremely helpful doctor. The presentation will take around 25, 30 minutes. And after that, we will have time for your questions. So if you have any questions, you can type those questions in the chat section starting even from now. Uh, all our IVF webinars, as I mentioned, are recorded. So this uh, webinar will be available on our website tomorrow. And yes, this is all from me for now. Dr. Natalia, if we are ready, we can start. Um, thank you so much, Sophie, for a great introduction. Welcome, everybody, uh, for me after summer break. Um, today, we're going to discuss uh, embryo transfer, uterus lining, and uh, implantation window, the physiology of the uh, uterus lining, uh, and how this factor uh, depends on each other. So um, let's uh, start first uh, with um, the embryo and, and X quality. So we have to be aware that uh, when we women, when we are born, we have a certain amount of eggs and certain quality of eggs in our ovaries. We have to be aware that through the um, social revolution, uh, women are modern, independent, they study, they use contraceptive pills in order to um, study um, the divorce. Um, and through this, they quite often um, postpone uh, their maternity. The problem that we are facing is that the older we are getting, the lower quality of uh, embryos we are generating. And here uh, in 2012, there was an amazing study presented on uh, 58,000 of uh, blastocysts, which were biopsied. And um, we were able to see that young women, egg donors, under uh, 35 years old, um, generate about uh, 60% uh, of genetically healthy embryos. Um, young women which are not donors generate about 50% all the blastocysts which are healthy. And the older that we are getting, the lower number of genetically normal embryos we are generating. The magic number to work uh, with our own eggs is until... Um, 40 years old, where between 38 and 40 years old, we generate 30% of eggs and embryos which are healthy. Later on, after 42, 43 years old, majority of embryos are genetically abnormal. 
the beauty of um, Spanish uh, medicine is that genetical testing of embryos uh, is allowed in Spain since more than 30 years through the very modern uh, legislation um, introduced a long time ago. The embryologists here in Spain have a great uh, experience. Um, so this makes uh, Spain leader in um, infertility treatments. The uh, genetical abnormalities that I'm talking here about, we are uh, aware of the most common ones like trisomy um, 21, uh, Down syndrome, trisomy 18 or 13, edwards rocato syndrome. But uh, in this uh, particular study in 2012, uh, we were able to see um, a very comprehensive work means not only the most common um, genetically affected chromosomes were examined, but all the chromosomes. So um, this gives the very high uh, value of um, the study. Um, we see that uh, if we do not apply pre-implantation genetic screening of blastocyst of women older than 35 uh, years old, the pregnancy rates without genetic testing are only 18%. Uh, when we work very correctly, where we perform genetic testing, we perform genetic selection, uh, then the pregnancy rates are um, about 60% uh, per transfer. So um, this is the reason why many patients are traveling to Spain after unsuccessful treatments in their countries without genetic testing to see what is the reason. Are the eggs... Um, yeah, bad through the time, the quality of them is low, and maybe this is the reason why uh, we cannot achieve um, pregnancy. Here you see um, IVF Spain cumulative pregnancy rate um, after three consecutive uh, transfers with euploid embryos, patients own eggs, IVF cycles um, above 35 years old. If uh, after uh, genetic testing of embryos, we see that um, they are all genetically abnormal or we cannot develop embryos to the blastocyst, to the extended culture uh, to day five. Uh, all the embryos have uh, poor quality. They do not meet definition of the blastocyst. Then uh, egg donation is recommended and the pregnancy rates through egg donation which we uh, achieve after three transfers in the area of Spain, in egg donation is um, 93% uh, per cycle. So the, um, the unique approach of IVF Spain is to see uh, what is the, the reason, what is the quality of your uh, embryos. Uh, we do not focus only on the morpholo uh, morphology of them, the way they look like, we focus on, on this, if the embryos are healthy or not, if we can um, transfer them um, or not. If uh, after one, two cycles with patients on eggs, um, all the embryos are genetically abnormal, this makes our patients um, easier to understand that achieving pregnancy with their own eggs uh, uh, due to their age is impossible and it makes uh, the choice of egg donation a lot um, easier. So um, we see that there are different uh, methodology in uh, egg donation process uh, embryo selection. We can um, select embryos uh, uh, that we generated through donor eggs with the time-lapse technology achieving 70% um, uh, pregnancy rates after PGS, the pregnancy rates cumulatively are very, very high. Um, we bring our patients to pregnancy rates of egg donors, and these pregnancy rates are um, age um, independent. So when we um, have focused already so much on selection of embryos, and we have to be aware that um, comprehensive new generation sequencing of embryos 
uh, after genetical testing, after trophoclodron biopsy gives us the highest um, success rates. Uh, this is the most sensitive methodology to select the embryos. We have to focus on uh, putting embryos, uh, euploid, healthy blastocyst to a perfect ground. So um, every patient on the day of a first uh, appointment uh, is examined uh, by a medical professional at IVF Spain. Um, uh, it's, uh, it starts with the smear test, uh, we perform uh, transfer tests and we perform transvaginal scan. Um, and the transvaginal scan, there are certain guidelines in ultrasound all over the world that tell us how the proper scan uh, uh, needs to be uh, performed. So uh, we need to see a uterus in the uh, sagittal cut where um, the uterus looks like a fruit of pear. And um, you can imagine that when I cut this uterus uh, in a sagittal way, then I see um, both uh, walls of the uterus, which are muscles, and what uh, is inside is the uterus lining, which is called endometrium. You can imagine that if I have it on the sagittal cut, I see that both halves of this lining should match identically. And this is something that in the first half of the cycle is described as three laminar, three um, layer picture. So basically I, I see the uterus lining as three lines, one above another. Um, if uh, this pattern is not uh, there, we have to to um, answer ourselves a question, why not? If we are not sure what is going on <clears throat> with this uh, uterus lining on the day of a first appointment uh, in IVF Spain, uh, we perform uh, hydrosonography, means um, with the catheter, which we put through the cervix, um, we put um, saline, uh, and uh, all the liquids in ultrasound we see as something black. So this makes an amazing contrast uh, to the uh, whitish uh, uterus lining. And also what the fluid does, it makes the um, two halves of the uterus lining, which are cut in the sagittal way, to expand. So I see if inside um, there are polyps, or I see if in the uterus line, in the uterus wall there are fibroids, if they have an impact on the uterus lining, which on the sagittal cut it's not possible to distinguish. So majority of our patients which have unclear picture and the transvaginal scan um, get a um, saline uh, intrauterine um, sonogram or hydrosonography. If we see on the day of a first appointment that there are anatomical issues um, that impact um, uterus lining before transferring uh, an embryo, the hysteroscopy has to be performed. Um, uh, the, in, in American medicine, SIS, hydrosonography, the sensitivity of hydrosonography is equal to diagnostic hysteroscopy. But uh, saline um, uh, ultrasound or hydrosonography, it's quick, can be done in the doctor's office is cheap because it doesn't require operating theater. And patients are referred uh, in IVF Spain to perform um, operative hysteroscopy only if on SIS we are able to say 
that there is a polyp of the, or the or the fibroid impacting the uh, uterus lining. So the operative hysteroscopies are done only when um, it's really necessary. The uh, diagnostic hysteroscopy uh, is actually replaced by um, hydrosonography. Um, so uh, these are basic anatomical uh, pathologies that have an impact on uh, the uterus lining and before uh, the embryo transfer they have to be uh, taken care of. If we see that the anatomy um, is, is being taken care of, um, then we have to focus on the thickness of the lining. Uh, according to the literature on the overtransfer, the endometrium thickness should be at least um, seven millimeters. This is the reason why all the patients um, the, uh, that undergo um, transfers in IVF Spain perform something called mock cycle where, uh, or, or test cycle where with artificial hormones we mimic patients' um, natural cycle. Uh, means in a substitute cycle, we put patients for 15 days, 14-15 uh, days with estrogens, uh, then we add five days estrogens and progesterone, and patients are being scanned on the 10 of the cycle to see how thick the lining is. Um, uh, they are put on, on progenova, usually uh, 6 milligrams. If the 6 milligrams is able to grow the lining, uh, to seven millimeters, then I know that this dose of hormones is well adjusted to your body, and this is the dose of hormones that we are going to uh, repeat in the uh, transfer cycle. Uh, so, um, uh, in IVF Spain, because a majority of patients undergo um, mock. Um, cycles, uh, there are no surprises in the transfer cycles. Uh, uh, we know exactly which dose of hormones uh, you need. So when you're flying here for the transfer, uh, everything is uh, very well prepared. So here you see the ultrasound picture where um, the three layers, three lines of the uterus lining that I was talking about are not there. So uh, in this kind of cases, uh, when the when the results are so obvious, uh, the hydrosonography is not needed. Uh, you just need to schedule patient for their uh, hysteroscopy uh, with uh, this uh, big polyp or or, or fibroid uh, removal. Uh, of course, if we were to transfer embryos to this kind of lining embryo has no chance uh, to survive um, and uh, this is no go in IVF Spain. Um, so um, that's why it's so important that patients are coming to the uh, first appointment um, or if there are any results which are not clear that we can always verify them uh, before uh, the day of the uh, of a transfer. So, as I said, the goal of the thickness of the lining on the day of a transfer is uh, seven millimeters. Uh, there are patients that with standard dose of um, Progenova six milligrams are not able to achieve uh, this thickness. And this is the moment where um, we recommend a higher dose of uh, estrogens to grow the lining, of course, with uh, medication, um, with uh, clotting prevention. Um, uh, if uh, this doesn't work, we do uh, long cycles where uh, patients are not only um, 15 days on estrogens, but longer sometimes 20, 25, and uh, patients are only flying to IVF Spain when we get uh, results of ultrasounds that the lining is thick enough. Um, uh, for some patients, some patients uh, respond quite well 
to Viagra, um, vaginal uh, Viagra. Um, if we see that uh, through long cycles, through um, Viagra vaginal, we, we still are not able to reach seven millimeter uh, lining, especially when patients have uh, DNCs in the uh, history, uh, then uh, we have to support the lining growth in the alternative way. And um, that's why um, in IVF Spain, uh, operative gynecologist, um, Dr. Rogel and his team developed an endometrium um, regeneration uh, study where um, in the last year, we were able uh, to treat um, 10 patients where, uh, where the transfer of them um, have been cancelled because of uh, too thin uh, uterus lining. And uh, these patients uh, for endometrium regeneration uh, with uh, partial Usherman syndrome are coming to IVF Spain uh, in the first uh, couple of days of their periods where um, um, their hysteroscopy um, doctors are putting uh, are micro injecting um, a platelets uh, rich plasma of patients uh, and this way uh, we hope um, to support the uterus lining growth um, in um, plastic surgery aesthetical medicine there is a lot of um, papers published now um, about um, quality of skin after uh, mesotherapy. Mesotherapy means with thin um, needles, uh, the uh, platelets rich uh, plasma are put under the uh, skin and this improves the skin quality. Uh, we were um, able to see uh, in IVF Spain that through this uh, protocol, adding um, estrogens, um, we uh, treated uh, 10 patients and because of um, different indications where the lining was not thick enough in previous cycles, um, uh, in three uh, cases, uh, we were able to achieve um, live births. What is interesting for me, um, uh, uh, two of these patients came back after this treatment uh, for the second child and uh, to my uh, big surprise in the uh, second uh, child attempt uh, treatments, um, the lining was growing uh, well and they didn't need any more uh, this treatment with um, micro injections um, of uh, platelet rich plasma anymore. So um, it allows me to think that uh, probably through um, subendometrial uh, platelet uh, rich plasma injection, it allows uh, endometrium to um, regenerate and uh, improves uh, endometrium quality not only in this cycle but also in um, future cycles. Of course, uh, um, Dr. Rogel and team they have uh, our full support uh, in the study. Uh, the cases are difficult. Um, and um, we, we need uh, a lot more uh, numbers to be uh, published, um, uh, but uh, the results for the beginning of a study are quite uh, promising. So we discussed the anatomy, anatomical issues of the uterus lining, which can uh, negatively impact the uh, embryo transfer. Uh, we discussed uh, polyps, fibroids, we discussed Usherman syndrome, partial Usherman syndrome, and how to detect uh, these pathologies. 
uh, now uh, we have to focus uh, a little bit more about and the physiology, how the uterus lining is working. Uh, sometimes we have beautiful, thick, uh, 10 millimeters uterus lining and um, we transfer genetically normal embryos and patients are uh, still not pregnant. Um, the uterus lining biopsies are indicated uh, by patients with recurrent implantation failure means after three transfer which were unsuccessful. You can imagine that in IVF Spain, uh, I don't allow my colleagues to <laughs> wait so long. I don't allow recurrent implantation failure to happen, especially when we transfer euploid embryos, which are um, quite hard to generate and expensive to generate. So basically after first transfer in IVF Spain with euploid embryo, where you do not achieve a uh, pregnancy, this is the moment where we perform um, in artificial substitute cycles, uh, uterus lining biopsy. And the story is always the same, that uh, in IVF Spain, we do not uh, transfer embryos in natural cycles. We transfer in substitute artificial cycles where we know the pregnancy rates in artificial cycles are higher than in natural ones. So patients are 15 days on estrogens, uh, five and a half days on progesterone, the 21 of the cycle that are coming to have your Spain, we do transvaginal scan, we see how thick the lining is. We come with the uh, special biopsy catheter to the uterus. Uh, we move ourselves um, back and forth uh, in the uterus uh, cavity. We remove um, a piece of tissue and we send it to um, specific uh, genetical testing. There are uh, different um publications there are different ideas why endometrium is receptive what is window of implantation we know that with progesterone around day 19 21 of a cycle it's a moment where the endometrium undergoes uh, the the cells of endometrium of the uterus lining undergo a specific um changes where the receptors of progesterone are being uh, expressed on the surface of, uh, of the cells. Uh, there is a very good um, blood flow. Uh, the immune cells uh, which are there are shifted uh, towards uh, TH2 ratio, um, the cells that support implantation. And there was no way in the world before um, microarray technologies um, to um, summarize all of these changes. And um, microarray genetical technology uh, through development of tests um, like receptivity assay or endometrium receptivity map where we see genetical expression of endometrium, uh, which summarizes all these biological processes, we know if endometrium is ready or not ready to accept um, the embryo. And the results that we um, uh, get through uh, endometrium receptivity map are very uh, straightforward, uh, where a patient is uh, receptive with a certain number of um, hours after progesterone intake or not. So uh, average receptivity window is um, with 5.5 days progesterone, but trust me, in my life I've seen patients pregnant with 7-8 days progesterone. So when we see with the first biopsy the patients are not receptive and they have few transfers behind, we uh, we repeat, we confirm the receptivity, adding one day more or one day uh, less of progesterone, uh, trying to catch the um, implantation window. So uh, this is how the array technology uh, looks like. Uh, the results are pre-receptive, uh, receptive or post-receptive. Uh, the uh, pre or post-receptive um, results are corrected through pre-receptive, adding one day um, of progesterone post-receptive, 
uh, giving a one day less progesterone um, and either transferring or performing confirmatory biopsy to know where exactly the receptivity window is. So um, uh, the endometrium is very important in the uh, embryo transfer um, process, uh, but um, if we see that with patient own eggs, uh, we transferred um, good embryos, genetically normal ones, to the good lining, we do not achieve uh, pregnancy or all the embryos patients on X are genetically abnormal, then we have to um, move on to um, egg donation. Uh, in IVF Spain, um, egg donation um, uh, is uh, performed uh, annually in more than 600 patients. Uh, we have uh, programs where uh, we focus on the five embryo guarantee with the highest um, implantation potential selected either uh, through embryoscope or uh, PGS new generation uh, sequencing approach. Why day five? Um, uh, because on day three embryos just contain eight cells. The pregnancy rates are low, 40, 50 percent with day five embryos. Good blastocyst culture, good embryo selection, over 90 percent patients we have uh, pregnant. Um, uh, egg donation, uh, egg donor selection process. In the first step of a donor selection process, we have to uh, see donors availability um, and the law. Law in Spain allows for egg donation, anonymous egg donation since more than 30 years. Uh, we have more than 500 donors available for you through the collaboration with universities. We teach students, we teach them that they have to uh, brush their teeth, do the smear test every year, that um, they have to have uh, safe, uh, protected sex with birth control pills and condoms. Uh, we measure their AMH. We recommend having children before 35 years old or social freezing. A lot of young women freeze eggs for themselves now in Spain. And if they decide to be our donors, we offer them uh, social freezing uh, for free. Um, donors are screened for infectious diseases, genetic diseases. We do everything that medicine is aware of to uh, find you a healthy, young, fertile donor. In the second step, patients describe themselves, how tall are they, curl of hair, color of skin, so we know exactly what kind of donor we are looking for you. We have your pictures where we see shape of your face, eye, nose, mouth. The computer program matches uh, it to uh, faces of different donors. 20 best donors are pre-selected um, for you through the computer program. And then eventually we doctors, we uh, decide who in our opinion is uh, the best uh, donor for you. Uh, for complicated cases with genetic diseases, um, we uh, offer testing uh, through Recombine where um, we match a donor genetically um, for you. So, uh, as I say, um, we do everything that medicine is aware of, um, that uh, your time to pregnancy is as short as possible. Uh, we are not afraid of difficult cases uh, when we have to match a second donor for you. This is my study where we match donors um, to patients uh, immunologically uh, from the immunological point of view, an egg donor, um, an embryo uh, is for you as a, as a foreign body, as a as a foreign uh, liver or 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 kidney. So uh, in selected cases, we match your HLA to the key receptors uh, which are on the surface of uh, natural killer cells, sperm selection on the day of a first appointment, basic spermiogram, and also um, the DNA fragmentation testing. If uh, sperm results are okay, a uh, majority of our cycles undergo testing with frozen sperm. If there are any issues to uh, correct, um, male patients are 
and vitamins um, and uh, fertilization with the fresh sperm uh, has to take um, place. The key success to good implantation is uh, embryo selection. The genetical testing is most um, sensitive. And if we uh, combine it with endometrium receptivity mapping for its timing, uh, the, um, the pregnancy rates are um, very high, uh, over 80%. Um, per um, transfer. So um, blastocyst, uh, it's uh, a key um, in uh, implantation uh, in egg donation cycles in IVF Spain and exclusive egg donation, exclusive plus egg donation. We offer you 16, 20 cells of a donor. Um, they are fertilized with your husband's or donor sperm. They develop to the blastocyst and then um, we have to be aware that there are no donors which uh, have all embryos which are genetically normal. Um, sometimes our cycles with four genetically uh, healthy embryos, sometimes with only uh, one. Um, so we recommend um, the uh, genetical uh, testing of uh, embryos, especially when we do second egg donation and, um, uh, cycle where time to pregnancy uh, should be as short as possible. Um, for patients with low ovarian reserve, where your AMH is low, uh, when the antral follicle count is less than six, uh, patient over 35 years old, sometimes we recommend something called embryo banking where we generate three, four blastocysts. Uh, in one cycle, we biopsy them, freeze, uh, we wait three, four months for body to uh, recover, and uh, in three, four months, we perform another cycle. So we bank the embryos, and this way, I always say to patients, if somebody has AMH lower than two, you just have to work double, uh, and then you have the same uh, success rates as everybody else with good ovarian reserve. The problem starts when uh, there's no good eggs, no good embryos, and uh, we need to move on to egg donation, but uh, through PGS testing, it's easier for us to accept it. The big day of a transfer, uh, this is something that I particularly like about Spanish medicine. It's something that I learned here in Spain. All the transfer in IVF Spain, we perform through the transvaginal scan where um, patient is coming to operating theater. We check a uh, patient's identity four times. Uh, in the waiting area when patient arrives in the um, uh, OPE theater inside, uh, um, it's checked by the doctor, by the embryologist. And uh, then again, in the moment of the transfer, uh, the patient uh, is asked for its name, uh, date of birth, uh, and the screen uh, in front of a patient, we always show the blastocyst with the name of a patient on a petri dish and uh, embryo is magnified so the, the patient sees the embryo that is transferred. Uh, the embryo uh, is put between two air bubbles uh, and then through the transvaginal scan you can see here two uh, white spots. This is the uh, thickest point of the lining where uh, the embryo is being uh, placed. We see it um, very well. The embryo has to be put far from the uh, uterine cervix, uh, far from the tubes in the best point. Uh, later on, after the transfer, the picture is taken care of to know, to show that we did everything uh, to do our best. There are no anatomical issues in this lining, embryo in the best position. And um, this is the key um, uh, to uh, this uh, success rates, which we achieve uh, in IVF Spain uh, through um, uh, PGS. This kind of um, transfer and receptivity assay testing in uh, indicated cases, the pregnancy rates for transfer uh, are over 80%, uh, clinical pregnancy rates over 70% after three transfers, uh, more than 90% patients have um, children um, at home. 
the the good news for genetic testing um, couples is that we erase your age, that we make pregnancy rates very high and um, age independent. Um, IVF Spain, through um, very well qualified embryologists, has uh, very high euploidy rates. Um, so the average of euploidy rate in the United States is about 60% uh, in egg donation cycles. Um, in IVF Spain, we uh, have about 80% uh, euploidy rate. So in the first attempt, uh, majority of cycles do not go undergo genetic testing in the second attempt uh, to make time to pregnancy as, as short as possible. They uh, do. Um, so uh, it, um, the, the euploidy rate has to do with the protocols which are used uh, in different clinics. Um, we are a hyperstimulation free clinic and uh, we try to generate not more than 30 eggs, uh, usually 20, 25 eggs, not more from one donor per cycle. Um, this gives us this uh, euploidy rate. So um, the uh, cycles with uh, PGS uh, last year were uh, almost 200 cycles. Uh, the uh, euploidy rates um, were confirmed, they were very, very high. Um, and uh, this makes uh, IVF Spain uh, one of the best competitors uh, in uh, egg donation uh, world here in Spain. If you would like uh, to be uh, one of our patients, if uh, you have a feeling we can support you with your own eggs, with endometrium issues, or with a donation, I'll be more than happy and my colleagues uh, to have you in our clinic. Um, now I think uh, it's time for questions. I'll be more than happy to answer them. Thank you very much. Yes, of course, Dr. Natalia, thank you for the presentation, very informative one. And of course, we have a few questions already. So we will start with the first one. And yes, here it goes. Age dependent success rate in assisted reproductive technology is referring to donor's age or the patient's age. And we have follow up comment. For example, donor's age is under 35, while the patient's age is over 45 and using donor's eggs and sperm to create embryo to be transferred to the patient. In egg donation cycle, pregnancy rates are due to donor age. As long as I know that in your uh, uterus um, cavity there are no anatomical abnormalities, as long as I know that your uterus lining is receptive thick enough, we can bring you to pregnancy rates of ladies which are uh, 30 years old, which are in uh, which are donors. Uh, so in egg donation cycles, pregnancy rates are a patient age independent. Means if I have somebody, if I have a patient who is 20 years old and she's in premature ovarian failure, um, she doesn't have eggs anymore, but she has an amazing uterus. Um, or I have a patient who is 40 years old, she has an amazing uterus, but uh, due to her age, her egg quality is poor, all the embryos are genetically abnormal. Or I have a patient, she's 50 years old, and she's menopausal, she doesn't have eggs at all. She hasn't produced them anymore. Uh, if I put genetically normal egg donor embryos to this patient, uh, the pregnancy rate per transfer in each of them is 70% per transfer, age independent, patient age independent. Thank you for the question and the answer. And PGD is genetic test before embryo transfer, correct? For the patient's age over 45, do you recommend to do PGD even with a high quality blaster? Ma'am, I do recommend uh, PGS um, in majority of cycles which are performed. Um, why? Because there is no uh, woman in the world who generates all embryos which are genetically normal 
Um, even young women generate genetically abnormal embryos, one, two per cycle, but they are there. And um, I cannot allow myself in, uh, in the office to have lawsuits because we transfer genetically abnormal embryos. At the age of 45, it's a very good question, madam, especially when uh, you are defined as recreate implantation failure, it means you had uh, cycles in your country with good looking embryos and they were not successful and you're still um, trying to be a mom through the assisted reproduction in your own eggs. Uh, it's good to do an IVF cycle with genetic testing because it can turn out that all the embryos that you have in one, two, three cycles, in embryo banking cycles, are genetically abnormal. And then, psychologically for you, it's easier to understand that time went by, we did our best to make it happen with your own eggs, and it's a time to move on for egg donation. Definitely, yes. Even though you generate me one blastocyst per cycle, I would definitely do PGS. I would recommend you to do one, two cycles more in two, three months to collect, to bank the embryos. If in two, three embryos, you have all them genetically abnormal, we have to move on. Thank you for your explanation, Dr. Natalia, and we will take a look at the next question. Is there a maximum size for endometrium lining? Can it be too thick for embryo transfer? Um, yeah, endometrium lining can be too thick for embryo transfer, and this is the moment where you start bleeding. You can imagine the uterus lining is growing. At the bottom of the uterus lining are vessels, and these vessels in each cycle are growing with the uterus lining. If we see that the lining is too thick, it's more than 40 millimeters, uh, the vessels are not able to support the upper part of the lining anymore. This is the moment where you start bleeding. And this is the moment where I cannot transfer anything. I have to, I have to, I have to cancel the, uh, the transfer. That's why when you're flying to Spain from different countries, uh, we, cannot ourselves, uh, we cannot allow ourselves for you know, canceling uh, donor cycles because you're bleeding, because your lining is too thick. That's why we prefer to undergo always a test cycle to uh, adjust a dose of hormones, especially to your body. Thank you for the question and a great answer. And we will now take a look at the next question. I am preparing to return frozen embryos for my next nation. I do not know whether it is worth doing the year map test because the embryos were frozen on day three. Yeah, um, you know, it depends a lot on uh, a temperament of medical director. When do you perform receptivity assay? In IVF Spain, when we work with blastocysts, um, when you are not pregnant with the first good quality blastocysts, I want receptivity assay now because blastocysts has, you know, the, the potential to implant uh, more than 70% implantation rate. So if, if you are not pregnant after first transfer, I want to know why. I don't want you to wait three times for, for three unsuccessful transfers. With day three embryos, pregnancy rates are lower. So if, if it was the first unsuccessful um, transfer with day three embryos, um, maybe you can skip it, uh, skip the receptivity assay testing and transfer this, what you have, if you're pregnant, amazing. If not, in the next cycle, blastocyst should be generated and endometrium uh, receptivity assay should be performed. And thank you. And uh, we will have the next question. Which procedure is the best to guarantee the perfect window implantation? Yeah, uh, the best procedure is to perform the uterus lining biopsy uh, on um, day 21 of a cycle with 5.5 days uh, of progesterone. And if the, the result says receptive, we can transfer. If the result says you're pre-receptive, then the results will recommend you to uh, get one day more of progesterone uh, and do confirmatory biopsy. If in the confirmatory biopsy you're confirmed 6.5 days receptive, 
then at the day of a transfer we give you longer progesterone to open implantation windows so uh the answer is very straightforward the best guarantee to perfect window of implantation is the uterus lining biopsy results which says receptive can say receptive day 4.5 5.5678. Thank you for the answer. Um, I need to come back for the previous question because um, <coughs> follow up comment and maybe we yeah. can help somehow. Sorry, I didn't understand the answer for my question uh, about uh, returning frozen embryos. And I don't know uh, if you can maybe add anything about here because there is something not. Um... Mm -hmm. Okay, it's easy to to uh, apply receptivity map to the blastocyst. We of course know how to apply uh, receptivity map to day three embryos. So when we have embryos frozen on day three, and receptivity is say is being performed with 5.5 days progesterone means uh, that um, when we transfer the three embryo, uh, the progesterone is calculated if um, it was to transfer a blastocyst. So you start three and a half day before. If the result says pre-receptive or post-receptive, then um we, we we give you progesterone one day or more or one day less so um with day five receptivity sa is very straightforward to calculate with day three uh it's also uh, possible to um uh, to perform and thank you for your additional comment <laughs> mm, you will take the next question which is this one? Third question. Is it suggested to remove fibra? But uh, from the follow up comment we have, we know that it's fibroid on the lining. How much fibroid has to be removed? That's whether it's fine, it only has small amount of fibra. And when we should do the removal during embryo transfer cycle or before transfer cycle? Okay, I understand that the question is about fibroids. Yes, Okay. exactly, yes. It was uh, commented uh, after the question. No worries. Yeah, so fi uterine fibroids, they should be removed uh, never, ever in the transfer cycle. In the transfer cycle, we have to focus on the good thickness of the lining uh, and on its physiology. Uh, we have to add more or, you know, or less progesterone to open implantation window. But endometrial polyp removal or uterus fibroids removal should be done uh, before a transfer cycle. And then uh, you can imagine that before doing reproductive medicine here in Spain and in the United States, um, uh, I was trained in, in, in Germany, yeah, and... Uh, um, operating, doing a lot of surgeries. It's a lot uh, easier to do uh, uterus lining, endometrial surgeries when somebody's in the half, a first half of a cycle, when the lining is thin, when patients is on birth control pills, okay? So quite often, you know, the, especially in Europe, you wait a long time for uterus fibroids removal. And then when, when the gynecologist has time, can fit you in, uh, you are in the second half of a cycle. In the second half of a cycle, you have a lot of, you know, thick lining and it's difficult to operate because you bleed. So what we do is when we know in gynecology that we have to schedule patients for surgeries, we put them on birth control pills. And then quite often this kind of fibroids or polyps removal are uh, on birth control pills, never ever in the transfer cycle. Um, when the fibroid is removed, uh, the polyp is removed with stop birth control pill, you have a period, uh, and then you grow the, the uterus lining with, uh, with estrogens. Um, we add five, five and a half day progesterone in a transfer cycle, and then embryo is transferred. And thank you for the question and your answer, Natalia, as well. 
And we will jump to the next question. What can be done if even after trying all options mentioned, the patient shows no significant endometrial development? Then we have to do endometrial regeneration study. Then we have to do the hysteroscopy. We have to look into the lining to see what is going on. Maybe you have adhesions. Maybe uh, uh, these adhesions are partial. Uh, if you have partial adhesions, then uh, we perform the hysteroscopy where uh, underneath the uterus lining, you get your platelet-rich plasma micro-injected um, under the lining. And this, the, uh, this makes the, the areas of the lining, which are still there, uh, work better, grow more. And you get estrogens artificially to let these uh, areas grow too. Uh, we wait uh, seven, 10 days for the lining to grow after um, the, the micro injection of uh, subendometrial micro injection of uh, platelet uh, rich plasma. <clears throat> uh, and then uh, if we still, still see that the lining growth is borderline less than seven millimeters, we uh, do lavage. We put the uh, to the um, catheter uh, transvaginal uh, to the cervix. We put um, the um, platelet-rich uh, plasma again in the womb, and this way we try to um, support the lining um, growth as much as we can. And thank you again. Uh, we will, of course, take the next <laughs> questions. I have had two failed cycles with my own ex. We are not trying donor eggs. I asked about testing my implantation window, but was told it was not worth the money, as the chances of donor X working was so high. Is that right? Okay. We have to, like, differentiate... Um three reasons why embryos are getting implanted or not. First reason is the embryos that we are transferring from patient on eggs have a very bad quality, okay? There's no blastocyst uh, or all the blastocysts are genetically abnormal. The second reason is I'm transferring outside of implantation window. The third reason is immunology. There are women that see HLA of their husbands on the surface of embryos as foreign body and no matter what we're gonna do, they will always reject embryos of a husband. So we cannot mix these three reasons, okay? When you had two failed cycles with your own ex, we have to see, was it a problem of an egg or was it a problem of an endometrium or was it a problem of immunology? When I see that with your own ex, I cannot develop blastocysts, genetically normal, healthy, no matter what I'm going to do, no matter how receptive the lining is, it will never work. So first, we have, to, we have to review protocols. We have to see what happened in your previous cycles. Have you had blastocyst? If yes, don't give up. Yeah, Try with your own eggs. If the, the, the blastocysts that you were supposed to have are very bad quality, then uh, we have to move on to egg donation. And of course, if you had three, four cycles, and never positive pregnancy test, you can have implantation window moved. So this is why we would indicate to do uh, endometrium lining biopsy and see the implantation window. Thank you for the detailed answer. And now we will take uh, the question, uh, which consists of two parts. And the first one, how tiring is it to collect banking embryos, but we have follow-up from mm -hmm. the full process of taking progesterone up until the retrieval of the egg was very tiring for me in France. I don't know if the doses of medicine was too much, but having an IVF made my belly bloat a lot and my body so tired. You know what? I can understand you. I hate progesterone too. I can only sleep and eat and grow, <laughs> which is not fun. So um, now seriously. Um, how many embryo banking cycles? 
Okay, the magic number in reproductive medicine, when we talk about euploid rate, number of genetically normal embryos to select from is six, eight blastocyst. When I have a lady and her AMH is more than two, and we uh, put middle dose uh, stimulation uh, to 25, uh, recombined gonadotropin, no brand names, no commercial here, uh, no conflict of interest, um, then I'm about to generate 20, 30x. If somebody has AMH between one and two, the same, the same protocol, uh, I'm able to generate 10x. When AMH under one, difficult, uh, low ovarian uh, reserve. And then the number of eggs which I'm achieving, if I have a great sperm quality, will generate 50% of these eggs are going to develop to blastocyst. This is something that we call blastocyst rate is 50%. Means out of 16 eggs, I expect eight blastocysts. And then age dependent. If somebody is 20 years old, out of eight embryos, six genetically normal. If somebody 35 years old, 50%, five um, out of eight, 50% for uh, genetically normal. If a girl is 40 years old, out of eight blastocysts, two, three genetically normal. At the age of 43, one genetically normal. So uh, if somebody has good ovarian reserve, if somebody has high AMH, you can have these numbers now in one cycle. In one cycle, I can do entire family planning. If somebody has AMH under two, and in first cycle, you generate me two, three blastocysts in two months, you have to go back and we do one cycle more to generate two, three more blastocysts. If somebody, so the answer is two, three months. The, the, um, the time frame where your body has to recover between uh, cycles is two, three months. Uh, if somebody after your first cycle generates me non-blastocyst, zero, no, everything bad, instead of, you know, beautiful blastocyst body, I have creatures with a couple of cells, then we have to talk about egg donation probably. And thank you for the answer uh, to this question. We have the next one. Does PGD or PGS testing have to be done embryo prior to freezing? Yes, ma'am. It has to be done prior to freezing. So we wait for the blastocyst culture uh, seven days. Five, six, and five, six days embryos are the best. They are biopsied and frozen. And I'll tell it and I'll sign it. We have higher success rates with genetically normal frozen embryos than with fresh ones because the selection of them is so sensitive. Thank you uh, for the question and answer as well. We will take a look at the next one. I'm 32 years of age. I am a patient of IVF pain. I undergone two embryo banking. First egg collection was 13 and mature to plus. Second embryo banking in August this year, 15 eggs, 13 mature, but only one made it blast. Mm -hmm. We now have decided to do third embryo banking on nearly the end of October. Is this okay? What should I do to improve my eggs? Mm -hmm. As I felt I have done as much as I can. I can produce loads of eggs, but very little to non blast. Uh... You know, um, there are some patients that are very hard working and you belong to one of them. And I respect you a lot for this um, because your blastocyst rate is very, very low. We have to see, because as I said, blastocyst rate should be 50%, 50 five zero. Yeah, this is something that we see in egg donation cycles when the eggs are amazing. If patients have lower blastocyst rate, we have to see why. And then embryology lab says, if embryos are fragmented, bad, between day zero and day three, it's a problem of an egg. If embryos are bad between day three and day five, it's a problem of a sperm. Uh, so um, yeah, this is something that we see that we have to work on to improve blastocyst rate. Sometimes you work on things very hard. You take vitamins, DHEA, 
ovocitol. Some some patients are even sometimes on on um, side saying a growth hormone protocol, and we still do not generate, uh, you know, good quality eggs enough to develop more blastocysts. You just have to work hard, and after three, uh, four. Um, embryo backing cycle it's the moment where you know f- four embryo backing cycles oh my god you are here every two months it's a one year process it's a it's hard job it's time to open up the the cards to put them on the table and say now i want to know if they are genetically normal or not if um you're fighting so much you're young 30 years old and we generate one, two genetically normal embryos, you have 70% chance per transfer to be uh, pregnant with this kind of embryo. So um, still, even though your blastocyst rate is low, uh, but if you generate one genetically normal, healthy, AB, AA, BB, good quality embryo, you have the same pregnancy rates as everybody else, And thank you. Uh, thank you for your explanation. <coughs> we'll take a look at the next question. I would like to ask about the quality of pre-implanted embryos. I have embryos with grading 5 BB. Is it too good enough for transfer? Uh, Elisa, in order to answer this question, madam, I would need to know how old are you? Because uh, I'm famous for saying, I don't want to f- offend anybody, okay, uh, that with good-looking embryos is the same story as with good-looking men, you know. Um, I was I was married 13 years, I work with, you know, male professional very well, uh, but um, I still believe that, you know, when you are older than 35 years old, there's no time anymore for experiments. And uh, especially when you're older than 35 years old, every other embryo is good. So uh, sometimes this BB quality guy uh, is healthy. Sometimes it's not healthy and nobody knows. Okay. So in order to a- answer this question, you'll need to add your age and then I'll tell you your chances. And I'm not a fortune teller, evidence-based medicine. <laughs> and thank you, Dr. Natalia, for this answer as well. Um, we will take the medical question again. <laughs> what are your thoughts on neuprogen? My neutrophil levels are quite low, and I wonder if this could be affecting implantation. Would neuprogen pure to transfer help? Oh, Romana. Uh, yeah, we have to see the neutrophils in blood or in the lining. Um, we know that results in blood are not as sensitive as in the lining. So uh, maybe it's, you know, worth it to double check the to do the uterus lining biopsy for immunology to see what is going on there. And then, um, yeah, um, we have uh, in our office, uh, you can imagine that uh, I had to do a PhD in immunology because of personal reasons a couple of years ago. And uh, I had to introduce all this immunological knowledge um, to the work of IVF Spain. So uh, we have um, a quite good study uh, that we use. Um, uh, we do not use nupogen, we use granocyte. And then it's inaccurate implantation failure. Uh, um, and then... Um, um, we have a protocol when patients are putting um, um, colony stimulating factors, uh, sub-Q injections uh, every day uh, in the first week after the transfer and then twice a week from the second week until week eight, I think. Uh, and the, the results with recurrent implantation failure are quite promising. So majority of our patients undergo uh, immune modulation with this medication um, after a couple of uh, unsuccessful um, transfers, but usually the results are in the biopsy and it's not about neutrophils in the uterus lining biopsy, it's about TH1, TH2 ratio. So if you say neutrophils, I think you're talking about blood, so take it one step at a time. Uh, verify um, 
you know, uh, the result through the uterus lining biopsy and was we'll take it from there. And thank you for the question and the answer. And well, next one will be this one. Is there an average rate at which endometrium grows per day on estrogen? <laughs> no, <laughs> there is not. So what we usually do is we monitor the first scan after um, patients start with estrogens on day seven, day 10 of a cycle to see how thick the lining is. There is a, a formula to follicles that they grow two, two millimeters every two days. Uh, there's a formula in uh, gynecology about HCG, yeah, the pregnancy test. If HCG doubles every two days means the the pregnancy develops correctly. I haven't heard about any formula to the uterus lining growth, but you know what? If um, if we expect endometrium to be seven millimeters on day seven of a cycle or day 10 of a cycle, so the lining has to grow one millimeter, one and a half millimeter every day. Yeah, uh, but um, you know, uh, there is no formula. No, it's just fun now. Thank you for letting us know and for your smile as well. Uh, we will jump to the next one about progesterone again. Does adding progesterone make the lining cause plateau? Yes, ma'am. So what we do is we grow the lining with estrogens. We want the result to be more than seven because I know with progesterone it will freeze the lining. It will stop the growth. There's only one medication that doesn't stop the growth of the lining with progesterone. It's Viagra vaginal, tried um, by patients. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, uh, progesterone stops the growth of the lining. Definitely, this is true. And, yes, thank you for this one. Mm. Taking the next one, with egg donation, do you choose genetically close eggs? Mm, you're asking me HLA, uh, if we match? Uh, no, not at all. Um, we match HLA uh, to key receptors. Uh, and, um, what we do is, when we have patients that you know, are coming to IVF Spain with, uh, and we know that they are carriers of sickle cell or thalassemia or some other diseases. We uh, either match there with donors uh, through the um, hair out test or uh, either, you know, a specific genes with a very high polymorphism, we do, um, the the gene sequencing of the donor to make sure that donor is not a carrier of uh, the same mutation that you are a carrier of. Okay, so um, we do not choose uh, genetically close eggs. Uh, the, the donor has to be you know matched specifically to the to the certain cases to the certain patients. And thank you again. Uh, for your question and the answer, taking a look at the next one, is there anything one can do to help the lining of the womb uh, for embryos to implant properly? Uh, definitely yes. So uh, when you see the, my presentation, first, anatomy, no fibroids, no polyps. Second, implantation window, biopsy. Third, proper thickness, uh, proper adjustments of estrogens. Uh, to your body to achieve uh, lining more than seven millimeters. And there is no more secrets. Thank you for this uh, question as well. How long is the ER map valid? Forever like genetic tests <laughs> or are there any factors that can change the implantation window and the ER map results? I like this question. Uh, yeah, usually the receptivity assay is valid for a year. If it's more than a year, we would like to confirm it. What is changing the receptivity assay results? Uh, delivery, DNC, procedures on the uterus, 
uh, yeah, that's about it. And thank you. For this one. I will then publish the next one. And the next question is, Hi, I had two type mm -hmm. donation fresh and, fresh and frozen. I got pregnant with one frozen embryo. It developed to heartbeat, but I started bleeding at that point. My doctor considers that fibroids in my uterus not be uh, not to be in the endometrium cavity, but there are many. I finally lost the baby. What can I do to improve my situation? Could there be another reason why it did not work? You mentioned clotting, for instance. Yeah, but we have to do a second egg donation cycle. We have to uh, do the workup, you know, from the beginning. Uh, means uh, there's no feelings. And the, the fibroids have an impact or they do not have an impact, okay? So how do I know this? Hydrosonography. How do I confirm or exclude something in medicine? Results. I have to work to, to prove it, that this is the, the truth. So hydrosonography, if we see that the fibroids do not have an impact, uh, we do the uterus lining receptivity to, to see your implantation window and then we transfer. If we see that fibroids have an impact, they have to be surgically removed, okay? <laughs> so uh, this is the anatomy. Then uh, the embryos, they have to be, be developed to the blastocyst stage uh, with the second leg donation. I would, transfer, I would test them genetically and then um, and then we have to see if your immunology is average, means you accept, uh, you know, HLA of majority donors, or we have to match donor to you specifically. Um, blood clotting, uh, yeah, when blood is too thin, um, makes us problems, but it's super easy to, you know, to exclude or confirm too thin blood. It's, it's just, you know, blood clotting test. You see platelets, where are we? Yeah, if there are too low platelets because you have like ITP, you have, uh, you know, hematological issues, uh, then we send you to uh, to specialist um, you know, with uh, with uh, blood diseases, and then we know, you know, what to do with you. Uh, then uh, you have to take uh, prednisone. Yeah, um, but um, this doesn't happen often. Yeah. Uh, annually, maybe once, twice, we have patients with ITP when the blood is really too thin, too thick blood, yeah, expressing um, medicine uh, in patient's language uh, means uh, there's a factor five mutation or, or uh, um, yeah, uh, there, um, there are proton B in factor two mutations, uh, then you have to take heparin until the end of, of pregnancy, yeah, so uh, blood clotting, uh, it's super easy to confirm or exclude through, through blood tests. And thank you for the question and your answer as well. The next question is, if my lining is healthy, 10 millimeters and IRA results move my window an extra day and I have no other complications. If my IVA donor egg did not implant, what would be the other reasons? Okay, uh, sometimes VA embryos, uh, they look amazing, but um, they are genetically abnormal, or sometimes even I have genetically normal embryos and they do not implant, yeah, because they are too weak to make it through. So I wouldn't cry that I had one transfer uh, and it failed. I would just work more. I would go for one transfer more uh and with good quality of uh, embryos which are healthy you have a chance to be pregnant in the next cycle yes and thank you for this and well uh, this will be also the final call for the question we have at least two more to go uh so we will take this one by one what is the emc procedure the one that contains the implantation window. Uh, EMC, um, DNC, DNC stands for dilation and curettage. Okay, DNC means if somebody has a miscarriage or if somebody has abnormal uterine bleeding, um, um, or if embryos are genetically abnormal and we see that we have to, you know, uh, 
uh, abort, terminate the pregnancy, this changes implantation window. DNC stands for dilation and curettage. Thank you for explaining this and uh, the question, of course, as well. Uh, we will now take the question which uh, is repeated. So the first part will be, how will you recommend in the first implantation to have one or two embryo transfer and a connected one? And what risk of the transfer of two embryos over 40 years? Okay, uh, blastocyst culture, genetically normal embryos, single embryo transfer, it's a key answer. Why? Because the embryo selection is so sensitive that the implantation rate of this kind of embryos is over 70%. As I say, through genetical testing of embryos, I erase your age. So I bring you the pregnancy rates of somebody who's 20, 30 years old. Uh, and if I transfer two genetically normal embryos at the same time, I do selective uh, double embryo transfer, your twin rate is more than 50% that I would like to avoid because twin pregnancy is always high risk pregnancy for you, your cervix can dilate, uh, you can stay in bed uh, till the end of pregnancy and I have to do the C-section, okay? So these are the reasons why we recommend single embryo transfer. Now, over 40, if the embryos are not tested genetically, we have to be aware that uh, the euploid array uh, at the age of 43 is 10%. So hmm, we can discuss double embryo transfer, but that's still with blastocyst culture, I prefer single. And thank you for your expertise, Dr. Natalia. And actually, we are done with the medical questions. We have the final question, which is this one. Maybe a bit of a different question, but could you tell us the situation in Alicante and your clinic after the terrible floods in the recent day? Have you suffered mm -hmm. a lot? Hope your clinic and everyone there is fine. Oh my God, Sandra, thank you so much for such a beautiful, you know, supportive, um question um you know um i have seen flood in alicante um a year ago where basically we had a water in basement a year ago so we learned our lesson that yeah we have like you know systems that are taking care of our basement now, um, the only department which suffered navy of spain this year was uh, a marketing department. Uh, we have marketing department in a different <laughs> building. So <laughs> what happened was um, they had they had water in um, not much uh, in the floor, but still you know floors were uh, were you know kind of wooden, so they had to be completely removed. And I remember, um, you know, um, we have, we're good friends with marketing director. And I said, listen, we have to do this presentation. This is something that I would like to add. And I was like very concerned because I came to the, you know, marketing department and she was not there. And I'm like, where are you now? And she sent me a WhatsApp and saying, listen, do not worry about us. I invite you. Uh, we are now on the roof in our penthouse. So, uh, you know, uh, we suffered, but still um, we made the best out of it. And um, yeah, in Alicante, in Ivy of Spain, we, we, uh, we didn't uh, receive as much water as in the suburbs of Alicante. I know, you know, uh, small cities like Orihuela, I couldn't believe um, myself when I saw it on the news. Uh, and, uh, you know, I still have my entire family in the United States. So my sister like called me and was like, oh, my God, what is going on there? So in, in suburbs of Alicante, yeah, the, the, this what happened is, um, is severe. It's Thank good you. to hear. Yeah, it's good to hear that you are all okay. And yes, marketing department mm -hmm. may be a little bit glad <laughs> for the <Yeah>. flood. <laughs> but anyway, I uh, hope it will not come back and be repeated anytime soon. Thank you for all the great uh, questions. And as well, we have some shout outs uh, for you for today and for your presentation and all the answers you gave us. 
But yes, gl glad to hear all your team is doing well and praying for the suburbs of Alicante. Thank you for today and thanks for the presentation and of course for all the answers and support and it was just super, right? <laughs> Thank you for this great evening. Actually, we did that. This will be uh, the end of today IVF webinars with Dr. Natalia Schlarp and IVF Spain. Uh, if you have anything to add, any final comments, please do that. Um, thank you very, very much for, uh, for all the um, questions that you guys had. Um, reproductive medicine is fun, uh, probably is the most beautiful part of gynecology. If you have any personal issues, um, we are offering free Skype, uh, you know, mini consultations. Uh, please drop an email um, to our um, uh, patient department or to uh, to eggdonationfriends.com uh, so we can see uh, your problem uh, in person. Uh, next month we will be catching up online again, so um, I'll be more than happy to discuss with you other topics in reproductive medicine. Thank you so much. Yes, indeed. And any, everything which we have from today, we will forward to IVF Spain tomorrow. So if you have any more questions, feel free to do that. Uh, it will reach IVF Spain anyway. <laughs> and as Dr. Natalia said, yes, we will be here again uh, with IVF webinars with IVF Spain. Uh, in October and in November as well. And you just need to stay tuned and please subscribe and follow us on our social media to be always up to date. Follow us on YouTube, uh, Instagram, or Facebook. Uh, and of course you can follow IVF Spain. They have great content there as well. It will be also a great pleasure to have you all here next week, same time and yes, same place. So for today, Thank you one more time. Good night or good day, wherever you are. Bye.